The global energy shift is driving demand for critical minerals, and among this group is uranium. On today's episode of Shifting Energy, we will examine the uranium market, tell you about ETFs tracking it, and factors that have turned uranium into a top-performing commodity. Stay with us. I'm Thalia Hayden with ETF Guide, and it's great to have you with us. Welcome to the very first episode of Shifting Energy, an original episode series that keeps you on top of big changes in the global energy transition. The quest for net zero carbon emissions is upending businesses and governments across the globe. It's also creating massive demand for alternative energy sources and critical minerals to make it happen. Now, uranium is among these critical minerals, and ETFs link to it, like the Sprott Uranium Miners ETF and the Sprott Junior Uranium Miners ETF have seen sharp increases in their share prices over the past year. So what's behind the move? Will it continue? And how can you position your investment portfolio to benefit? Here to discuss that and more is John Champalia, CEO at Sprott Asset Management. Hi, John. Welcome to the program. Hi, thank you for having me. Great to be here. Great to have you with us. Well, we know uranium was among the top performing commodities in 2023, and it's off to a strong start in 24. In term, it's lifted the performance of the Sprott Uranium Miners ETF and Sprott Junior Uranium Miners ETF. Both funds have been hot performers. Now, what's behind the surging uranium prices? Yeah, it's um, it's been a really interesting commodity to watch, uh, particularly over the last 12 months. And it's it's really dri being driven by two main drivers. One, uh, the world is pivoting back to nuclear energy for a number of, I think, very compelling reasons. One, it, uh, as you mentioned, it does provide zero greenhouse gas emission electricity production, which the world is increasingly focused on cleaning our grids at the same time, producing, you know, very reliable baseload energy, what nuclear energy provides. Uh, second of all, it provides um, very um, uh, high levels of energy security. And that's a term that many people haven't really heard about before or haven't heard for probably 50 years. This was really in, in uh, direct response to the uh, energy crisis that we face, particularly in Europe and Asia in 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine. People really realized that if you didn't have secure supply of energy, whether that was natural gas or coal or oil or uranium, that uh, they could put your economy and national security at risk. And nuclear power is, as I mentioned, it's a very reliable for form of baseload power. And governments are, are shifting back to it to help mitigate against some of these other risks. And then I would say the last reason is, is about how it complements renewable energy. Um, governments around the world are trying to incentivize more solar and wind and other clean forms of energy production. And though that's really been great, but obviously you're dealing with an intermittent source of energy um, and nuclear is like the perfect complement because it's on all the time. Now, at the same time, you have this shift back to nuclear energy. You also have the fuel that uh, that powers all of these power stations uh, is in a supply deficit. And that's because we don't produce enough of it to meet our annual needs. So as you could imagine, when there's a supply and demand imbalance, uh, typically what happens is you have a price that adjusts to either incentivize more production, which is what the world needs in the coming decades. Uh, and that's exactly what's happening with uranium and why it went up 89% last year. That makes sense. Technological advancements are also impacting the uranium market. CNN, in fact, recently reported that next wave nuclear technology, also known as small modular reactors or SMRs, has kickstarted a nuclear power renaissance. Now, how promising are SMRs and is it getting any public support? Yeah, it's a really exciting development um, that the industry is, is trying to capitalize on. When you think of a typical nuclear power station, these are uh, large power stations. They, they power large cities and urban areas. There's about 434 of them right now in the world uh, with 59 more being built and another 100 plus being planned. That doesn't even include this new technology, which is called small modular reactors, which as the name implies, it's a much smaller version of uh, a power station. The reason why it's exciting is because the plan is to 
use these in, in a more versatile way, meaning they could be applied to powering smaller cities or towns. They could also be used to repurpose existing coal fire, fired power stations, uh, basically, to, you know, swapping out the old coal, coal fired boiler, putting in a small modular reactor. The thought here is that you would build these in factories and then bring them to site and put them together. Um, and the hope is they would they would be lower cost because they're smaller scale and they just have a lot more application. Everything from producing electricity to producing industrial heat. Um, and, and there's a lot of excitement. There's a number of companies that are commercializing the technology. And once these are deployed and we're talking about five plus years from now, we could have hundreds of these new small modular reactors deployed around the world. And it, it is something that I think is very promising. The UK, the US, Canada, they're all at the forefront right now trying to approve new designs, uh, commercialize them and deploy them at scale. Wow, that is promising. And besides uh, geopolitical factors, the global shift to renewable or clean energy is another key trend at work. Now, the International Monetary Fund recently said, quote, the world remains far too dependent on fossil fuels. Wind and solar energy alone will not be sufficient to break that dependence. And nuclear energy represents a potential solution to both problems, providing a firm source of electricity that can complement the variable sources of renewable energy on electrical grids, end quote. So how is the scramble for reliable energy sources impacting the long-term demand for uranium? Yeah, I mean, that, the, the statement you just, you read out is it's just like a perfect summation of, of the stars kind of aligning. Now, remember, we had the, we've had this technology for decades. We built out a lot of nuclear energy capacity in the 1970s and the 1980s. And, and that was because we were focused on energy security at that time after OPEC really squeezed and embargoed oil. So there are a lot of similar parallels that are happening today. Unfortunately, not all of them are positive, but there are a lot of similar parallels to what happened in the 1970s and 80s. And it is why we think we're now entering another, you know, a lot of people are using the term nuclear renaissance, another period of, of build out. And yes, that build out is really being led by places like, like China and India and, and the UAE. But we see a, a real strong commitment back to nuclear energy happening across many countries in Europe, uh, South Korea, Japan, the United States, Canada. Um, and we think this is gonna last for not one or two years, but given the long lead times of these projects and energy policy in general, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna be very supportive for the uranium mining sector for the coming, say, 10 to 15, 20 years. Wow, that's exciting. One of the unique features of the Sprott Uranium Miners ETF is that it includes exposure to both uranium miners and physical uranium itself. Now, this innovative design offers a fresh approach to the uranium market compared to an all-equity approach. Can you tell us more about URNM's holdings and strategy? Yeah, well, you know, a lot of investors, they look at the the supply and demand fundamentals, and they look at the, the resurgence and in interest in nuclear energy, and they naturally say, you know, how do I get exposure to this in my portfolio? How do I invest in the sector? Uh, there's really only two ways. You can you can invest in vehicles that own physical uranium, and Sprott has one of those, or you can take a more holistic approach and invest in an index that holds uh, a whole slew of different uranium producers, developers, exploration companies, as well as including uh, some physical uranium. So it's a nice it's a nice way to play a higher commodity price, as well as playing the companies producing uranium and that are going to be producing uranium in the future as they move their projects from you know, development to, to actual production. So it gives you a nice cross section across the, uh, the entire uranium spectrum. Makes sense. But besides URNM, your firm also manages the Sprott Junior Uranium Miners ETF. How does URNJ work and what type of investor could it appeal to? Yeah, so URNJ is, um, is I guess, an ETF that's designed to really play the companies that are very early stage producers or small producers and up and coming producers. So what we do with that particular index is we remove any exposure to physical uranium and we remove the two largest uranium producers in the world, which are pretty meaningful players. So you really get the next tier of, of up and coming companies 
Um, it's obviously going to be more volatile. Uh, the companies are smaller cap, they're less liquid, and obviously they're still subject to a lot of expiration risks. So it's for someone that wants to take more a more aggressive bet on higher uranium prices. So, so then how do you see funds like the Sprott Uranium Miners ETF and Sprott Junior Uranium Miners ETF being deployed by both investors and financial advisors inside an investment portfolio? Yeah, I mean, we really see a, a wide range of applications in terms of how investors are positioning this in their portfolio. We often will find investors that will put it within their energy allocation. Again, this is another form of energy. Um, we sometimes find investors put it inside of a thematic related to energy transition or decarbonization. That's been very popular. Pairing it with renewable energy funds, that's another application that we see. And then finally, I would say, we we find some investors just allocate this in their commodity bucket. It's an alternative way to get exposure to commodities. Most commodity indexes do not include any uranium whatsoever. They're obviously heavily weighted to oil and gas and agriculture and whatnot. But most of these bellwether indices to get ex uh, commodity exposure have zero weight to uranium. So it's kind of a way to tilt your portfolio to a commodity that you may be missing. Ah, we see. That was extremely informative. Hey, thanks so much, John, for the great insights. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, thanks for the discussion. It was great. You're welcome. And that does it for today's episode of Shifting Energy. If you enjoyed the show, tell us in the comments section below by hitting that like button. To learn more about the investment strategies and ETFs we discussed on today's program, be sure to visit SprottETFs.com. I'm Thalia Hayden with ETF Guide. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.